So the plan this time is to actually record the lecture while I'm talking to this computer. Should help. All right, so um, this is the first in a series of uh, slides about where we go into looking for mechanisms, trying to explicate mechanisms that give rise to heavy tail distributions. And these, so these would be power law size distributions. Generally speaking, we're interested in statistic, the statistics of surprise. And um, so, but we're, you know, we're going to make it mathematically kind of solid around this uh, story of um, power law size distributions. All right. So, where we go? Uh, there will be hmm, references to Monty Python. You don't have to worry about that. And the Princess Bride, which is important. Okay, so I know this thing isn't in the right place. Yes, the team is back. We're not happy. This maniac is downstairs asleep, I think, after a good day of being a maniac. All right, so random walks. We're going to talk a lot about random walks. Uh, we're going to talk about the first return problem. So this is, we're going to have a little uh, zombie texter who's going to text and wander around, lurching the zombie bit. And we're going to wonder about when they'll come back because they're a zombie and, you know, double tap. All right, so, and then we'll have, even though they were our friend, uh, and then just, a, this seems like a bigger section than it is, but we'll have a, a few sections there and I'll have to clean up the, the title. Um, the menu here. All right, off we go. So we've got to do this, mandatory. Good. That was important. Right, so random if you like silly walks, but let's let's make them just random. And we'll think about a very, a very naive, simple idea of uh, a random walk. There are all sorts of um, elaborations. We'll touch on that. This is a place we're going to visit, right? So it's all very pleasant. The Snormals, uh, Gaussian-shaped uh, uh, mountains, normal distributions. We'll come back to why we name things in these ways. But this is... So it's easy to visit that first place. Uh, we'd actually like to explore this, and unfortunately we explore it in, in the real world um, somewhat frequently. So most of the little mountains in this mountain range are fine, no trouble. We go up and down them, we go up and down them. Occasionally, you know, every 10th mountain is a bit bigger, and every 100th mountain is bigger again by some factor, and then every 1,000th mountain. And then there's still lots of little ones all along the way, but occasionally, and if we're really unlucky, there might be an infinite mountain. So, yeah, so we should expect them, but let's still call them the unexpected mountains of reality. For some reason, there are postcards being delivered from this place. So, uh, complexity, right? So the rise of complexity. Gravity's a big deal. It makes a squishy ball thing that we can sit on uh, and evolve out of with the games and the evolution. But... Randomness in general, pretty good uh, thing. A um, little, little bit of engine to, uh, to generate some novelty, right? So this is our, we're quite excited about that in evolution, for example, because a person with a large beard thought about it for many, many years and then eventually published it. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is, so this is a piece. We're going to just have pure randomness. It's going to be in a structure in some way, but it's going to give rise to some, very nice patterns. So, structure coming out of randomness. And random walks, so that's our little game. So this is, as I said, a vast literature here, and um, you know, it's a real thing. Randomness is a noise in general, it's a very important real part of the world. Uh, and it can be helpful for um, <clears throat> defending a system, right? Because you, add, you, you don't make it completely um, solid, you actually add some sort of flexibility to it. Uh, it's just a natural part of things that we, we examine. So a lot of science, I would say, uh, there are a couple of ways to approach things. One is to strip the random structure of something until you find the structure. 
And the other is to kind of build out and you know, build the structure out and then see the randomness is sitting on top. But it's not a bad way to approach things. Like just keep peeling away the randomness. Okay, so it's going to be very simple. One spatial dimension. So we're just going to have a little um, uh, discrete world. And we can just go plus one step, minus one step. Doot, doot, doot. Uh, and uh, time will be discrete as well. So just a clock. Just tick, tick. And our little uh, zombie texter is going to go right they're just sitting here and they're lurching because they're zombies so they're lurching backwards and forwards uh but they're compelled to move because it's a horror movie and you know that's what happens they need brains but they're not they're not concentrating right they're looking for brains but they're not concentrating so they're going to start at zero and then lurch left or right plus one minus one we'll put on a you know a normal axis so it'll be plus one plus two plus three and then we'll be worried about how far they get over time. When do they come back? Again, you know, should we be really prepared for our former friend, who is now a zombie, uh, to come back? So we have a very simple little probability distribution in the middle of it. We just have plus one, minus one. This could be made into a continuum thing, all sorts of things. But either you go plus one or minus one, and there's a probability of a half of each one. And it could be biased, all sorts of things. Uh, we'll visualize it as in different ways, but especially this way, I suppose, which is the, the movement will be up and down. But imagine that's our zombie. So here are just a couple of examples of, of random walks. Uh, 10,000 steps, so just simply plus and minus one, just randomly flipping coins 10,000 times and summing them up cumulatively. All right, so we'll get to that. And... All right, so we start at zero. That's actually starting at zero there. And you can see this one, you know, it's kind of staying around zero, eventually starts to pull away and heads into the negative column. So if you are here and you're playing a gambling game, which is just heads and tails, say, uh, and this is uh, the big bad, right? Then, you know, trouble eventually here. But all sorts of things can happen. Also trouble. You might have thought you were doing pretty well, 5,000 steps out and you're hanging in there. Uh, but it starts to go wrong. Peril comes good. And of course, if you think of these as narratives, right, these could be sporting games, and we'll come back to that at the end of all of this. Um, could be score lines. And uh, yeah, right. So this, this, you know, the, the team on top is losing here, and eventually they, they win and they kind of hold on. This team, yeah, it gets close again, but then it sort of keeps kind of going away and they keep, you know, working the score up. So if you were just given one of these, you know, you can tell a story. People do it all the time. For, and there's, of course, an XKCD for this, but you know, we know this. People love to tell stories, and um, randomness is no obstacle for us. In fact, it's an engine of stories as well. Uh, you know, you might think, look at this. This is, this is a really, this game is like, wow, it's just, uh, if it was sports, right, it's just a really, really stuck Everyone's just uh, fighting backwards and forwards with the points, and eventually, you know, they don't really get away. Uh, this one, just kind of, you know, boring. Everyone is leaving to go home around this point. They've given up. Of course, you know, it was just a random, random um, walk, but they were still entertained, right? Because the commentators can say things. Okay, uh, and then some of these, you can see that the one one team in this case is is ahead the whole way, like right. There's some trouble here maybe but they're ahead the whole way so we'll we'll think about that as well um, right endless examples so you can play around with those if you want easy to generate you just go boom 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 make them see what you think now the range on these is minus 300 to 300 the timeline is 10,000 steps um, so the range is not very big right so even though we look at these and there's maybe one team or one side or you or the house if we're gambling is winning and you think all right that's kind of they they haven't certainly gotten to the end limits which are uh if it's all heads or all tails or all plus ones or all minus ones it's going to be a slope of one and it'll be plus ten thousand and minus ten minus ten thousand so they're the limits so not even close to that right i mean these are just some examples those you know those walks exist right but there are only two of them uh, out in this ensemble of walks, and I want you to think about this, uh, these, these walks in that way. There's an ensemble of 
walks that start at zero. We give them 10,000 time steps. There are two, because it's plus or minus one, there are two to the power of 10,000 walks. It's a pretty big ensemble. Right, and so they're all sp they're all different, right? They're different. They've gone different ways. Uh, you know, so w walks of length just one. There are only two of those, right? Up and down. And then when we get out to you know two more, then we have a walk that went that way. We have a walk that went that way. A walk that went. That's two to the power of two, so it's four four walks. But if we're interested in where they end up, right? How much money you have in the bank? You don't really care about the pass so much. So um, you know, who, who won the game, then, then that's a different thing we think about, right? So we'll be going from the ensemble to thinking about some time point where we bin the, the random walks, and I'll give you some visualization, um, as to where they are, right? So you'd expect it to be centered around zero, symmetric distribution, and we'll see. Okay, so let's just do some very simple things. So we the, the displacement after t time steps for a little zombie texter, right? Plus or minus one. It's the sum of the means of all of those um, random variables, and that's the. Um, if, sorry, this is the next step. If we if we want the the mean displacement, it's a, it's the um, mean of the the sum, which is the sum of the mean, right? They're independent variables that can have no effect on each other, so we just have to add their means up to get the total. The mean of any one of them, plus or minus one, half, half, is zero. So, pretty quickly we have this, right? So that we have, we expect our random walker, our zombie texter, to be right back where they started. We know that's only going to happen at the even number of steps in, in these discrete time ones, but that's fine. A continuous time, we can do other things. But like, we'll have to take that into consideration when we do some calculations. So, Right? We expect our zombie text to be back home. Uh, and and odd, we'll leave the odd number of steps out. So what's that? You know, we expect that the chance has to go down. We expect them to be at zero, but the actual probability of them being there should go down. They're, right, they're wandering around all over the place. So it's a bit strange. You think they might get away. And we'll think about d equals two dimensions, d equals three, and then we'll think about networks and so on. Okay, variances. So how typically how far do they get away from home? Right? We're watching the zombie, you know, we've got our various zombie killing instruments ready. Um, or at least, you know, we're Googling for them, uh, trying to watch some movies. How do you do it? So, you know, time is of the essence here. So we have the, the variance of uh, the position at time t. It's a variance of the sum. It's just by the definition here, and then so some of the variance. This is a lovely feature of the variance, and it's a reason to use it in general, again, for independent variables. Um, there are other measures maybe for, for distance away that are, that are better, but um, in some cases. Anyway, so this is, a, of course, the, the, the square of the um, typical, it's a, the distance from the mean, in general, squared, and we're averaging over that quantity. Right. And in this case, it's just one, right? So the, the mean is zero. So we have the difference to minus one step and the difference to one step is, is one, right? Because we're gonna, we're gonna, and then we're squaring it. So it's one minus one squared and one squared and they get a half weighting each. So the variance is easy to compute at that level. So it's just one, half plus a half. We're summing over T of these um, variables. So that just adds up. It's one plus one plus one out to one. Uh, t of them. And that just sums to t. So the variance is t. So this is a really, this is our first sort of big deal. It's kind of a profound um, aspect of uh, randomness. So the typical displacement, the, the, the how far you expect them to be, right? Even though we, right? So we expect them to be at the origin, but we expect them to sort of be surveying some range that's typically on the order of t to the half. Right. So it's scaling much slower than time, it's t, t to the square root. But we have a little, a very nice little uh, scaling model here. And so let's just come out pretty quickly from adding random numbers to each other. 
So it's a non-trivial scaling rule, and we'll call this, we could call it, I mean, it's random walks, but we could call it additive aggregation. A little mechanism, very simple. There's no memory, right? You forget where you are, um, and things just get accumulated. The last one in $10,000. Uh, now he gets that over. He gets that one over. That has never happened before, incidentally. That was an historic moment on The Price is Right. So that was exciting because they needed something to happen. Uh, all right, let's do it again because it's perfect. The last one in $10,000. Uh, now he gets that over. He gets that one over. That has never happened before, incidentally. That was an historic moment on The Price is Right. Incredible. All right, so um, Plinko, yes, great moments in uh, Random Walks appearing in daytime game shows. Uh, so these kinds of things, these, these, these incarnations of Random Walks have been around for a long time. Uh, the old Latin word, I believe, is, is Quincunx, uh, Galton Board, not a good person, but um, he's smart, unfortunately. Uh, so Galton's name gets stuck to it. Again, we just shouldn't name things after people. Sometimes called the bean machine, right? So there are all sorts of contraptions like this, <coughs> usually on these little, uh, yeah, the little triangular lattices. And so what's going to happen is as a ball hits it, it's going to bounce left or right. And so if it's well structured, that's the case. You can imagine making this actually work is going to be a bit tricky. Okay, so that's a, you can look up bean machines. It's not what you might think beans or a bean machine is. But, okay, so here's a, here's a little simulation. Um, so same idea, right? So a bean machine. Balls are falling out of the top here. And let's, let's restart this again. Okay, it's going pretty fast. So you can set the size of the thing and, and uh, whether it's 50-50, right? You can have drift. Uh, and so this is piling up pretty quickly. You start to see there's some symmetry, although you know, it should actually be, because this is an odd number, it should be the middle two should balance out. So it's going to take a while. Right? There's, there's, no, there's nothing special about 8 versus 7 because of symmetry. They, sh they should end up with the same number of balls, statistically. But they, you know, probably is funny, right? We could end up with some something stuck. Not in this case. So you see the edges are hard to get to, right? That would take, uh, all these all these balls would have to go all the way down here, the whole way down here. Um, and that's just not happening. Starting to even out. And so let's go to a one that's been around running for a while. Same game. We've had one make it out to plus 15 and um, zero to the other side. It's filling in pretty well and it's, it's quite balanced, right? It's within like 10 or so balls in some in, in sort of the main areas, 20 maybe in the middle there, but it's starting to take a pretty clean shape. So each one of these are little zombie takes. So you see they're really, it's hard for them to, to get away, even though, you know, they've always got this chance of moving and chance of moving. All right, so we'll, we'll let that one run. Why not? Go back to our fabulous slides. Okay, <clears throat> so let's think about counting these things. So each walk, each special walk, uh, has a chance of being manifested of one over two to the power of t, right? So t time steps. And we're not talking now about where they end up. That's the histogram that I just showed you growing. We're talking about the specific um, random walk, the, the whole thing. And uh, each random walk is special, right? They're all special files. So the chance of having some random walk that ends up at zero and it follows exactly this path, you know, if you like plus one, plus one, minus one, minus, right? Some sequence of plus one. It's the same probability as one that's all plus ones or all minus ones. So we should be surprised by any, you know, equally surprised by any sequence of plus ones and minus ones. They, sh they shouldn't. Usually we think about how much they add up to, so of course we would be rather taken by um, all heads or all tails. Okay, so again, we're interested in this histogram that's being built, this 
you know, where, where, the, where the, the walks are ending up. So that collapses things a lot, right? So in, in, instead of having uh, two to the power of t walks, now we have, uh, you know, if you like two t walks, right? That's how many in, in terms of where they can end up. So it's a much smaller fraction. Two to the power of t is growing exponentially. So this is going to be an important thing. So you're going to have to work with this. Uh, the number of walks that start at x equals i go to x equals j and take t time steps to do it. All right, that's what this is saying. This, it's the number of distinct walks. So for instance, ones that start at zero and end at zero and take 100 time steps would be n, zero, zero, 100. Okay. So to do this, we want all the random walks that uh, step by j minus i, right? So they start at i and we can forget about the fact they're at i. We just need to know that they manage to move j minus i in displacement. J can be negative, right? It's just whatever these, these numbers are. You can put anything you want in there after exactly t time steps. Um, and we know that that won't work if it's, um, say, an odd number of time steps and we're trying to go an even number of uh, steps and so on, right? So there's some zeros, but we'll, we'll, we'll handle that well. So here's a question you will work through. So this is a binomial. Whoopsie. This is a binomial distribution here, uh, right? So it's t choose then this uh, blob on the bottom which is um, the number of time steps plus the displacement divided by two because we, we're now going to think well let's say you want to go um, you want to increase by four go plus four in ten time steps right so that means you have to have um, you know, say seven uh, positive steps and three negative steps and then, then you can think, all right, okay, fine. And now I have to arrange, now I have to think of all the possible ways to put the three negative steps in, in, in order, right? So it could be the first three, so it goes down, and then seven up, that would get you to plus four. Or it could be all seven positives and then three, or it could be arranged in all sorts of other possible ways in, in the middle. So all of those, so, you, so then it becomes a, a binomial, right? We're choosing because no, it's about locations, we're choosing the number of, um, uh, <clears throat> we're trying to find the number of ways that you can allocate the positive steps or the negative steps, it's equivalent, such that there are seven and three in this case to, to give you plus four. So we'll play around with that and think about that. All right, binomials, which will come back, it's all built in. So how does this probability behave for large T? So this is a profound, beautiful result. So we're going to clean things up a little bit by saying let's have an even number of time steps. So we'll put an n in here. Um, so after two n time steps, x can be two plus or minus two plus or minus four, right? It has to be even. And we'll set that to be two k. So we're going to have a two n and a two k. Right. So we're, we'll have to deal with the twos again in various ways, but that that will just help us a little bit. So the probability that after two n time steps we get to two k, well, we just we had this expression n i j t. We're going to substitute in i equals zero because we start at zero. We end at two k, and we have t equals two n time steps. So going back to the previous business here, right? So we have two um, n on the top, and then two n. Um, uh, the different the displacement has to be 2k right so it's 2k minus 0 so it's 2n plus 2k divided by 2 so it's going to be n plus k on the bottom so it's 2n let's get to this 2n choose n plus k which is equal to 2n choose n minus k or 2n factorial over uh, n plus k factorial times n minus k factorial Factorials, I'm sure you, you're thrilled to know. Sterling's approximation, right? So that will pop up a few times in the course. Sort of one of the most spectacularly useful um, asymptotic uh, formulas. So it's for factorials. And so it's Sterling with an I, because of course we had to name it after someone. But if you like, you can think of it as an excellent, excellent um, approximation. And if you 
work with this thing in the right way, you end up with the, the probability that the, uh, at, at t time steps, we started with an even number, and we'll, we'll be able to sort of clean that up, takes a little bit of um, deafness, but you end up with this, right? So this is a normal distribution. Right? e to the minus x squared over 2t, so this is the classic structure. There's mu is 0, the mean is 0 here, so it's x minus mu in general. Um, so it's x squared. There's a 2t on the bottom. The t is sigma squared, right? So normally this would be 2, the, not normally, the general expression is 2 sigma squared. We've already established that t is um, the square root of sigma. So that pops out the front as well. So we would have 1 over root 2 pi for a normal distribution with a sigma here. Sigma is the square root of t, so that works out. Everything cleans up, all the twos and whatever uh, constants and so on. This is really a beautiful, clean thing. So you have to normalize things properly. But uh, lovely. So it's the normal distribution of snortum. Gaussian, different names, but of course, we should not use the names of people, I think. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk. that just keeps coming back in this course. Uh, Stigler's law of eponymy is the, is the, the touchstone. I'll mention it again. Okay, so that's a specific case of the central limit theorem, right, which is a much more general uh, story. So if you add up uh, random variables that are independent or pretty much independent, like you can loosen that restriction a little bit. Um, they don't have to, of course, like we've just, we've just have plus and minus ones here. They can be random variables as long as they don't have large variances. They don't, the variances don't explode, which is that whole power law business. Um, <coughs> then you'll, you'll get a Gaussian. So Gaussians and Gaussians appear everywhere. It's an incredible observation. Um, an incredible achievement to derive this thing. I mean, it's a non-trivial distribution. Uh, right, so it's a good example of where we just started with these little plus, one, plus or minus ones, we're adding them up, and now we've got this you know, fantastic uh, expression at the top, and it appears everywhere in nature and you know, well done us. So the whole is different from the parts. That's a good Phil Anderson uh, example. A point also to stable distributions. Link is to the Wikipedia, uh, which is described well in Fella. Um, it's a, a, a two-volume set of classic classic work and probability. If you're really interested in digging into things, you could go go to that. But uh, stable distributions are you know, it's a it's a, a parameterized family. Um, the parameter goes from zero to two. There's of course the the central limit theorem is is there um, for uh, adding uh, so so what what's going on? Sorry, not the central. Stable distributions are such that um, you have a, a random variable distributed in some way, another random variable distributed from the same family. You add them together, and you get a, a third random variable which is distributed again the same way. So if you add something that's normally distributed to something else that's normally distributed, different means and variances, then you well we know what we get. We get uh, a normal distribution, some of the means, some of the variances. That can be seen to generalize to uh, there's a whole there's a whole uh, continuous family of such distributions that, and they're called stable distributions under this uh, summing of variables, which means they're convolutions. Um, give you the same expression, so all, all very very joyous. Now all of those and it includes things like the Laplace um, distribution, the inverse Gaussian, they all have power law tails. So that's when things get a little funny. They are also, I'll add this, a good example of where you might think, oh, this is where all these power laws come from. You know, we're kind of adding things together. We love the central limit theorem. Let's generalize it. But, you know, you're starting with power laws there, right? So this is what we'll call later pleplo, power law in, power law out. Um, you, we, we want to understand good uh, elemental mechanisms that give rise to, to macroscopic structures. So, fabulous result. Normal distribution comes out, and we have this scaling of the um, standard deviation as the square root of t. So here's a, here's a way to, to look at this, just a sketch, but um, it, it is, in fact, the truth. Uh, so what we're talking about here is diffusion, right? We can start with a spike of stuff, and over time, it's spreading out and spreading out and spreading out. We were thinking about a little zombie texture, 
But we could start with a bazillion zombie textures and let them all run off. And they, so they start, they're all piled up in a, uh, together, and then they just start to disperse. And if we counted up the number of zombie textures, we'd get this um, uh, distribution spreading out. Lots of things do this. Even uh, you know, uh, the f flow of electricity on networks, all sorts of stuff have similar behaviors to, to random walks. We'll, we'll get to some more examples later on. So, uh, yeah. So you can either think of one zombie text and we run them over and over again, or we have them all running at the same time, but they don't interact with each other. Very important, they don't interact with each other. So it's different to if you're a fan of the classic game Lemmings, where they kind of bounce off each other. Well, no, they don't, they go through each other. Yeah, you have to make a blocker. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so Lemmings, pretty good. But they don't randomly walk, anyway. Uh, all right, so what's happening as, so here's one random walk, just as sort of an example, and at any given time, if we take a big ensemble of random walks that end at this particular time, or it's that we just take them at that time instant and look at their, where they are, then we end up with a normal distribution. That distribution spreads out and spreads out. And it's what's happening is it's growing. It's, its standard deviation is growing, exactly as square root of t for this particular model. So plus or minus 2 root t would give us 95% confidence interval, roughly, which is normal. What happens with normal distributions? So, this sort of fit with our earlier observation that there's 10,000 time steps. You know, there wasn't a lot of range um, for for the, you know, the the movement of the zombie texture, but you know, spreading out. So, reasonably benign. It's diffusion. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, diffusion later on. Uh, but just just a really fundamental mechanism. It's kind of happening everywhere. Our brains are probably diffusing, you know, blood um, energy diffuses around your, your body, all sorts of things are happening. It's diffusion is a pretty good um, little basic mechanism that we can profit from. Uh, yeah, hope. All right. The, just simple random walks this is stepping back from the normal distribution, but it's all connected. But, um, you know, Pascal's triangles, right? So. Uh, we could have named it after various other people, and other people just name it after other people. It's a big mess. It would be nice to, again, name it after what it is. Uh, so the counting is built into algebraic forms. It's just a, a tremendous amount of stuff going on here. If we had, so this is not time anymore. This is H plus T um, for heads and tails. So just imagine them, you know, so they're real numbers, but we just sort of leave them as these little objects. Um, if you expand the h plus t to the power of n, you x plus y to the power of n, then we get this little little beast here. It's all very simple, right? So the binomial coefficient is here, and then we get we're combining k heads with t to that. So that's really what this n minus k heads, right? And this this will give you this number here is how many ways we could get k heads and um, n minus k tails. Uh, so when when k is zero or n, there's only one way to do it, right? Because it's all heads, and it's all tails, and yet what you do is you're sort of going, you're going across head plus tail, head plus tail, and we're picking out head, tail, head, tail. So it's the same game as a random walk, um, right? And there's the binomial piece there, and this is just you know, for, for power of three, right? H H H. If we spread them all out, but so these are all different. This is again to sort of say these these walks are all different, right? That's three heads, two heads and a tail. But actually these three here end up in the same place, if you like, right? Because there's only there's one tail in each of them. But this is again to say they are distinct in their specific history. Hmm, delicious. So that should fill my time. But there's a, a lot more stuff um, that's connected to it. Just touching a few things. All right, so um, we visited the snormals through our random walks, we've made them. Uh, and there are various ways to do it, but this is the path we took, sort of literally, right? So it's paths of random walks, a little bit confusing. But it's just a random road through the forest of forgettable events. And uh, you know, here's, here's a way to sort of indicate the, the standard deviation up here. We have houses of usual size and trees of usual size. Everything is pretty good. Just sort of a bit of a Charlie Brown squiggle there. And the snormals are up in that direction. So that's um, fine. We can 
then go on to look at other parts of random walks that will give us some strange things. Right. So it's all fair. We've got some nice mathematical objects coming out of this, but it's pretty safe. So let's think about this. So this is going to matter if you're gambling, which I don't advocate. Uh, or if, you know, whatever your random walk is measuring. So C, R of T, this is going to be the probability that after T time steps, you have crossed or reached the origin R times, right? You've hit it R times. So, and you can think about crossing and, and hitting the origin. We'll say crossed. So coin, coin flip game, how often does the lead change? Uh, and we'll have, I'll mention some more about this later on. Uh, but this is just to give you a little, little piece. So what's the chance you, you make a comeback, right? And we saw that in some of those random walks. Like what's the chance you, you make a comeback? So the, if you look at the most likely number of changes, you might think, well, you know, as you go to 100,000, you know, maybe it sort of scales in some way, right? Maybe it increases, maybe logarithmically, maybe 20 is the 30, 100. But in fact, it's true that zero is the, right? Someone gets in front, that you expect the lead to change zero times. That's going to be the mode. It doesn't mean it outweighs the lead changing at least once. That's different. This is just the probability that the lead changes zero times versus one time versus two times versus three times. So it just decays, right? It doesn't have some form like this. So this is the thing we're going to get to is that the expected time between tide scores is infinity. I want you to really just try that on. That is a pretty weird... I think it should feel not intuitive. So your zombie texter, who you're very worried about, right? They step up, they lurch away. You know, you're putting the things together, whatever you need. Um, double tap, There's some rules about this. Steps away. Half the time they'll come back, right? So right, 50% chance they'll, they'll come back within that time step. But you know, there's some, it, so it's two steps. There's a less of a chance they'll come back in four, less of a chance they'll come back in six, da, 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 right? It's decaying. But the expected time that you have to wait, just as they start to lurch away, the expected time, the average time you should, you know, put on your watch thinking mm, is infinity. You will, they will, they will surely come back. That's another piece we'll get to later on. They will, they will definitely come back. You expect them to come back. It's just that it will take an infinite amount of time. Um, okay, so that's a weird one. This is an interlude. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, but this is a, uh, an example not here. Um, this is just to give you something completely different from random walks. It's from a paper from 21 years ago, but published in Nature. Well done, Nature. Um, it's random walks on hexagonal lattices, and the game here is, well... Tying knots um, can be thought of as well. It can go in through the center, right? So this way or this way, around the right or the left. And so that's what all these little, it's just, it's just an incredible paper. They're using um, the uh, right, in, in or out uh, uh, vectors here, right? To sort of indicate which way we're going in or out of the page. It's designed so that if you're looking in the mirror, it'll help you. Um, and then this is the construction of that knot based on this particular um, sequence. So uh, the game was to say, well, let's just have random walks on, uh, on a hexagonal lattice. So if it goes out, then that corresponds in any particular of these three dimensions that corresponds to, um, uh, you know, the, the, the tie going in one way. If it goes in, it's going the other way. So you have three dimensions, and then you have these two. Um, it could go in or out. All right. So this is a way of then enumerating all knots, right? So this could have been useful for uh, um, uh, people living in an expensive um, building in the 1920s, possibly called Downton Abbey, where they, although quite possibly never tied a knot themselves, rather useless human beings. I think one of them managed to be able to scramble eggs and that seemed to be an achievement, but wow, what a time. Uh, 
anyway, yeah, the weight staff seemed to be rather thin at this point uh, in my circumstance. Um, <coughs> in fact, now we think about it, that's that's my job with respect to the cat. Anyway, so they enumerated um, all of these possible ties, right? Here are all these theoretical, now we're in theoretical tie space built out of random walks and looked at, a, you know, came up with a bunch of characteristics for um, for ties that would be nice. So there's the number of moves, which is a, you know, right, so it's how, how long it's going to take, the number of center moves, so it's sort of a, a, an important part. And then you end up with uh, things like um, symmetry, how often you go left and right, and then balance, it's like how much winding does it go one way or the other. And so all these numbers are reported here for these different sequences, right? So the simplest one is just you go in and then uh, so it's actually, it's out this way, around right, and then out, and that's it. So that's not a knot that people um, actually use, right? The knots that people use are the sort of four well-known ones, the four in hand, the Pratt knot, I'm sorry about that, and um, the Windsor and the Half Windsor and the Half Windsor. And I was, I, I went to a school where I had to wear a tie for the last three years, and um, the older, one of the older kids, um, I had to wear a Windsor knot. So, all right, so I learned how to do a Windsor knot. However, I think I slipped in some way because um, I had to, in reading this paper and, and playing around with it, I realized that um, a few years ago that I uh, was not doing it the right way. So, I have to refer to the literature here. But they've really, they've uncovered some interesting ones, right? So this one here uh, has uh, nine moves. There's no name for it. It's nothing that anyone's discovered, but it's, extremely well balanced right it has a very good the winding number balances out and the symmetry is great so um you know maybe this is what we should be doing so all of these um upper class twits going off to um you know play polo or whatever it seems they could have done it worked a bit harder and um found some more knots anyway we well, should check if these have caught on i don't know So there you go, random walks uh, lending themselves to uh, fashion advice for uh, people who want to wear funny things around their necks. Okay. Let's go to this problem of first routine. It's going to have some nice applications. It's a beautiful thing in itself. So we've got our zombie texter. They're leaving. What's the probability they come back after tea time steps? And, and will they always return, right? So I've given the game away here, but um, it, it is, it's it's going to be a strange, strange story. And so what happens if we're, our zombie texture is in two dimensions or three dimensions? Okay. So we're going to find a nice parallel size distribution, right? So this is another generative mechanism kind of story for where we, how we might see a, a particular parallel size distribution in the real world. I mean, the whole course, you know, we're going to touch on a few uh, major ones, they're going to be examples that come from randomness, um, come from simple, plausible mechanisms, ones that come from optimization. Um, you know, and you'll have to sort of think about in the real world which, which things might be at play. Um, but very interesting, evolutionary reasons and so on. And I think it's fair to say there are some dominant mechanisms that you see over and over in, in, in many different um, uh, fields or many different uh, you know sort of uh, phenomena and you know there are some rare ones as well right so there's a whole world of mechanisms that exist and, and then which ones dominate different different stories so we're getting one of these parallels out some physical structures and some kinds of structures may result from some random walks um, and uh, we'll have this other part about uh, scaling relations, so how exponents can relate to each other. All right, so let's work our way through this. So we're going to have an example, I don't know, a few pictures like this, but just a simple random walk. Here's one that it first returns after um, a time t equals 8. You can see that. Uh, then after that, it first returns again, if you like, at time t equals 10, if we kind of reset. And then at time t equals 14. 
we can call all of these just returns, right? So they can be just returns. There's an idea of first return and just returns. So there are returns here at 8, 10, and 14. The one at 8 is the first return. And we, we're, we're interested in that because it's the first time we're going to have some serious uh, discussion with our zombie texter friend. We do not want to become a monoprint. So it's a probability game here, uh, which we quite happily turn into a counting problem, common forks, and go back and forth between these things. Um, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of uh, a lot of thinking comes down to um, quantitative. It comes down to counting things really, really well. And uh, <clears throat> even when we have continuous phenomena, or phenomena that can be that, that behaves continuously. Um, yeah, you know, we end up putting on a computer somewhere and, and linear algebra walks in the door and says, there you go. All right. So, the series of steps here that I'll walk you through where we turn this problem, what is the probability at time 2n, we uh, first return to the origin, we'll, we'll turn into easier problems. And it will connect back to the number of walks that go from i to j in t time steps. So, all right, let's think about a specimen here. Uh, our zombie text that would either lurches to plus one or minus one, that has to happen. So let's think about them if they're moving, um, you know, just for example, we, we, can, we can just have a mirror of this, right, uh, to plus one. So we have a mirror of this for minus one, so plus one. And then for it to first return at 16, this is just an example, we would need the walker, the walker to do whatever they want, um, and they can come back to one, but they can never touch zero, right? So they can bounce around however they want. There's going to be a limit to how far they can get up here, right? Because they still have to turn around and come back to 16. So there's there's the extreme version where you know, they just go up and then down. So it's plus, plus, plus one, and then minus, minus, minus one. So it's all heads and then all tails. Okay. So that moves us a little bit towards something. It, it's not obvious yet, but it will help. So our first return at 16 is the same as having a walk starting at 1 and ending at 1 for 14 time steps, right? We're going to subtract 1 off each end. And can't, now it can't cross it, right? So this is a it's just a slight difference. Here we had the walk can't touch the x equals 0 line, and now it can touch it but not cross it. Same problem. I mean, they, they can be connected. But it is, it's a, a slightly different framing that will, will turn out to save the day. So the probability, probability of uh, first return after two in time steps will be the same as the probability that we start at one, right? Start at one, that's, uh, okay. Start at one and end at one uh, at time t equals one, time t two n minus one. And then we just stay above one equal or greater than one uh, in between. Then we add a half here, and that's going to because, be because we want a half a chance. We have to take all walks that go to 16. Half of them go back up to plus two, so we want a half there. And then the two is to account for the fact that we have um, the walks that go to plus one and the walks that go to minus one at the start. So these are the words. That, uh, that back that up. So here's our approach. So we're going to count number of walks, and we'll get to probability at the end. We're just going to simply count. Um, and we had this quantity, just nijt. That's going to be the, the game. So we'll, we'll just step through this. So we want to consider all paths. This is a different thing. All paths now. We're not. We don't care if they cross one or whatever. Just consider all paths that end start at one end at 1, and then take 2n minus 2 steps. We we have that quantity, right? So it's just n1, 1, 1, 2n minus 2. Now, if we can take that number and we can remove the, the number of bad walks, or ex, what we'll call excluded walks, that do go to 0. So we, maybe if we can count the bad walks, then we can subtract them off. And we'll have some figures on the next slide. So we'll call them excluded walks, and it's a method of images. This is going to be the game, and, and you know this is used in lots of different um, 
uh, problems uh, in, in many sort of fields, especially in physics. Uh, so there's some, some game where we kind of create a mirror image and we can play around with that. So some cleverness. All right. So these are uh, examples of excluded walks. So the black ones are the excluded walks, right? They're the bad ones. All right, so let's look at them. So here's one. It starts at one, boop, 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 and it does a bad thing. It goes to zero, right? It ends up at one, right? It has to do that. This one starts at one, so oh, this is a fine, but now it does a bad thing. Actually, it goes negative, still bad, it's all bad, and then it gets back to one, so it's a bad walk. What we do is we say, all right, well, let's find where it first hits zero, and then we will flip the first part of the excluded walk, so boop, flip it, and so it connects at zero because has to and then we'll make the blue one just match up from there on out so first part that it hits zero we flip the black part or black um, curve make it blue right and then we just match up from there on out, even though it's going down right we don't flip that part so just to flip um, for everything before the first zero and then we match up and if you think about this for every excluded walk there is a, a walk, every, every one of these black walks, there is a blue walk which starts at minus one and ends at one, right? So when we flip the first part here, plus one, that has to go to minus one, right? So plus one has to go to minus one. So now we can say, and, and if you think about this, th there's going to be a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So we can go the other way and we say, all right, let's think of every possible walk that starts at minus one and ends at one. It has to cross the zero line, x equals zero. And then we could construct one of these excluded walks, right? We could flip the blue one, do the opposite. We'll flip the blue one, and then what makes one of these bad walks? So every excluded walk, there's a, we can make a blue walk. And for every blue walk, we make an excluded walk. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping between them. The blue walks, no, we don't really care about anything. We're just saying they go from minus one to one. And we're good at that. We're good at counting things that go from one place to another without any other restrictions. So this is the clever thing. We've started with every walk that starts at plus one and ends at minus, uh, plus one, right? Just to have all of them. And the excluded walks we figured out, um, I've argued, uh, are equivalent to the number of walks that start at minus one and one, end at one. Cool. Just delicious, right? So these say the words um, that I possibly just spat it into the air. Uh, and what we're going to say then is the number of walks that first return is going to be um, equal to the walks that start at plus one, end at plus one, all of the walks, minus the walks that start at minus one and end at plus one. Because these, when flipped in the right way, will give us exactly, will give each one of those will be an excluded walk. So we have n one one t and then n minus one one t. We have to worry about the t's and things like that, but, but that's good. Oh, okay. So it's it, I do have it at the bottom. Okay. So here it is. Uh, if I can get this to work. All right, down the bottom. Yep. So the number of first return after two n time steps, it's going to be the number of walks uh, that start at one, end at one, and there are two n minus two. Uh, steps that they have to do that, minus the ones that end at, start at minus one and end at one, and again, the same number of walks. Have to worry about some um, fractions and things, but you need to, so we'll, we'll think about that, right? So will we get one from each side? Yeah. So, if you play around with this, and you use Stirling's approximation, be very careful and so on, and, and make sure you calculate everything in the right way and keep everything organized, then you end up with this structure. And so let's look at what's going on here. We have a root two pi on the bottom. We saw that for the normal distribution. It's a bit of a mislead. End of the three halves on the bottom. So decaying as n to the 1.5, right? So it's a gamma. So it's n to the minus three halves. It's a gamma that's between one and two. That's important. Two to the two n, 
th that account because we're ballooning in the number of walks, so that's what that's going to be, and then just the two to the minus three two. We're going to normalize it to get probability. So there are two to the two n paths, right? Two n. And if you do that and you're careful with it, so we're just going to divide through. Um, we're going to organize ourselves. So there's just a, you can see that the two to the two n, they, they cancel with each other. The mi that, that two to the minus three halves can be put down the bottom and organized in there. So we're going to take this, uh, there's a, a two to the minus three halves. We're going to combine that with the end of the three halves and put them together. So it's two n minus three halves. And the reason we do that is because t is two n. So that's going well. And then we end up with this rather amazing result that it's proportional to t to the minus three halves. So lots of things come out of this, but it is a power law decay. Um, and this is for our zombie texter. It's a strange business. We know that two, within two steps, 50% of our zombie texter friends will come back. They're not our friends. They're not your friends. They're not your friends. They're not who they were. So they will come back, right? Got to be ready. But on average, we're waiting an infinite amount of time. It's pretty crazy, right? So gamma equals three halves. If you had a continuous version, you get the same thing. Um, it's normalizable, right? T to the minus one is where it all explodes. So we can normalize it. We're always, there's, every one of these zombie walkers will come back. Uh, but the mean, the variance, all higher order statistics um, are infinite explodes into flames and um, so yeah expect a long wait except for half of them that come back immediately basically so gambling is bad um, I hope you kind of think that's true in general but uh, yeah I, I guess if you have an infinitely wealthy opponent uh, not not ideal really in trouble yeah like 50 50 games yeah so usually that the house is in that category of being approximately infinitely wealthy. So yeah, who knows what happens in these machines. Um, I do know the story from years ago that uh, at some point in Las Vegas, they switched to, you know, they used to have the puller thing. This is a spork being used as a one-armed bandit. If you haven't heard that term, a one-armed bandit. Um, and then you could push a button, you know, like an electronic, and then you could push a button and just watch the random walk, which, you know, stories, people are happy. It does seem like a lot of uh, zero work. All right, so higher dimensions, what happens in higher dimensions, you ask? D equals two, the walker has to come back. There are more ways to escape. Now there's like, the, your walker lurches away, your little random texter. Now they've got, they only come back a quarter of a time in that second time um, step. But they will, in this case, still come back with probably one. It's even worse, in you know, the, it's still an infinite weight on average. Um, but once you get to three and higher the dimensions, maybe they won't come back. I mean, there's a probably, they, they, there's a non-zero probably they won't come back. And that's you know, been solved. It's extraordinary. Um, there's my friend. And uh, Polio is the uh, person here with the, uh, the large brain. Uh, Polio will come back with a sort of very uninspiringly named uh, urn models where you think about putting balls in urns and adding more balls and so on to paste them based on color of balls and things it's it's it really is much more interesting than, than it sounds and um, urns sort of you know immense cremation or something which is not not what's going on there say like buckets or whatever cool thing you want to put them in your tick yeah, anyway, right i was going to say TikToks, but that doesn't work so random walks on finite spaces. So imagine you've got a donut, or imagine you've got a, 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 a grid, and the grid connects, right? So if you wander off this side, you'll pop onto this side, and your random walker will wander off this side. So that's a that's a, a donut or a bagel, depending on your culture or idea of health. They can be gluten-free, um, vegan, non-vegan, all sorts of things. Uh, <clears throat> or a tire or something like that. Anyway, a tube. Okay, so... Uh, if you have something like that, then eventually your walker will end up everywhere equally likely, right? And we talk about this thing invariant density. So we have a, it's a dynamical system. We're letting this thing run. And we, we remove time from, we say, well, you know, in the long time limit, where do we expect this 
Walker to be, where we expect the system to be more generally. Um, you know, that's why chaos has, so in chaos you'll see strange attractors and very, people get very excited about it and so on. Um, uh, so you can get these non-trivial um, invariant densities. Uh, networks are extremely interesting in this case because we're going to um, see something quite beautiful, which is, and, and you can solve, this is a nice problem to solve for, it's in Pux volume two. We, we, um, we get at this little bit of linear algebra action. What you figure out is that if you've just got, so you've got a network, doesn't matter what size, and it's just a evenly weighted, right? So that if you're on a node, you randomly walk to any of the node's neighbors. Just let that run. And you can imagine lots of little zombie textures on this network. Um, Google search essentially worked like this um, early on. And so they're wandering around. They pile up. So the clock ticks and they end up at a node, right? So in between that kind of clock tick, you can imagine moving, walking along the edge. So at the, every tick of a clock, they're all clumped together. And they end up, uh, depending on the number of them, they end up, uh, well, in a bit of that, but they end up being proportional in number. Um, the number of zombie textures ends up being proportional to the degree of the node, of the nodes, right? So. Um, if you've got a node of degree one and a node of degree seven, then there'll be, depends on how many zombie texts, but there'll be seven times as many at that degree seven node. Interesting, right? So, and, and really what's going on there is that networks, the local degree, the, the degree of the node, how many neighbors it has, is functionally the, like the local dimension. Right? So if you think of we're in one dimension, you know, we have two places to go. If we're in two dimensions, we have four places to go. If we're in three dimensions, we have six places to go. Uh, if we think about just simple square lattices. So there's, a, there's an effect like that. Now, when we think about them in the interstitial parts, when they're moving along the edges, this is where the, I think the most beautiful part is. Um, then if we counted up how many are traveling along each edge, we'll make this, then they're organized zombies, so they don't bump, well, they do, they get around each other. If we look at every edge, then the the the, um, the fraction of zombies that is traveling every edge each way is the same. So that's uniform. That gets us back to diffusion where everything is smushed out. Everything is uniform. It looks we're interested in nodes usually, and it's usually usually I will say this in general networks you want to think about the edges. Um, a bigger story is you want to think about groups within networks. You don't want to think about just networks of nodes. But um, yeah, so that's the that's the, 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 the beautiful thing. The edge part, the, we go back to what we had with normal space. And we see that in normal space, it's really that the edge part of it is where there's uniform distribution. And um, the nodes are, because they all have the same number of uh, edges on uh, the same degree, it works out there. But it's really about edge space. So that's a, that's a cool result. Okay, this is all for finite things. Okay. Right. So this is a piece about scaling relations. And we'll look at it through the lens of um, river networks, which may seem a, uh, an odd place, but river networks, right? So this is the, the, um, the structure that we have on top of you know, our continents. It's the, the big pattern, you know, that we can, we can see from space. Indeed, satellites opened up a lot of analyses here. Uh, but of course, branching networks like, like river networks are everywhere. And, and in Pox Volume 2, we come back and we talk about um, river networks, but also blood networks, which are allied in some general, general ways. Uh, but so you're, you've got these things sitting inside you, of course, right? So they're distributing from the heart. Uh, after, in this case, a three-dimensional uh, space to the capillaries or capillaries, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and then, so that's the arterial supply. And then the, the venal network brings it all back. All right, so this is a little toy model that's going to have randomness built into it in a very explicit way. So it's going to be, we like the hexagonal lattice. So this is a, a triangular lattice. There are points in here. So at each point we flip a coin and then we say, okay, the flow, the, you know, the river runs through it and it goes um, left or right, right? So this is this big piece here. 
And then what happens is we end up with, like this is a little basin. Imagine flow is going down. Flow goes from this point and this point. And you know, any sort of, if there was rain, it's kind of, it would, it would, it would um, go over the surface or maybe under the surface to the, to the actual channels, right? So these are channels that you would see walking around. So this is a tiny little basin and it has a divide, right? Like you'd have to walk over a ridge here to get to the next basin. And then this is a basin oh, that's a bit bigger. And then this one is quite large relatively and it goes all the way up to the top. So a question of interest here is, and this is for general river networks is, if we, you know, what's the architecture of these branching networks that are so important um, to us? And is it special, is it universal, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, and what's the, you know, we obviously know erosion and, and these sorts of things and, and flow underneath. These things are all working out, but, you know, this is not, not an easy thing to model. And uh, there's, there's been advances, but it's, it's, it's definitely not something where we've you know, got it perfectly done. So this is just a toy model. Toy models are incredibly important, something we'll... I'll just try to touch on as we go through. Toy models are simple to understand. They give rise to interesting behavior. And they can tell us stories that we didn't expect about systems. So that's, that's my sort of essential point, I would say, about toy models. And then there's the limit of the other limit where you have a kitchen sink. You try to model everything, right? So pandemic, for example, you want toy models that tell you stories about, that, that, that help you understand how um, collective behavior can work. Um, with respect to disease, but you don't get carried away, too carried away with it. It just gives you a sense of things, you know, things that you can't see if you're thinking of from an individual perspective. And then you also want to model it with every detail you can you can put in there. Um, and you know, and you can be very clever and smart and all these sorts of things. But but that's sort of the game. So so there's flow going down. Equal probability, and we're just interested in what shapes are being produced here. So we've got these basins, and they have random walk boundaries, right? So if you if you walk up from the, the bottom of one of these, the the divides also follow random walks, and so they could go this way, right, or this way, or this way, right? So there's a, a kind of a quarter of a chance that the basin gets smaller. There's a quarter of a chance it gets wider, and then there's a quarter plus a quarter, half of a chance that it stays the same. So it, it's really sort of two random walks, uh, and we're interested in when they hit each other, so we imagine two random walks, and so we can subtract one off the other, and then we end up with really a random walk um, like we've had, and we're interested in that first return. So that kind of collision of random walks can be recast as a first return. With this, with a half the time, and we don't have to worry about it too much, but a half the time um, the walk is just... Uh, it's 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 not moving right so it's not it's not going up or down it's got these pauses right this is just a factor of half it's easy to deal with so um basin starts off and ends and we can think of it like a just what we've done a first return random walk process problem so immediately we have this result that the in, in this sort of infinite random uh directed river network we would have the probability of a if we go to a point and we say, what's the basin that's beating, what, you know, what's the length of this basin? We call it the mainstream length. You know, how, how big is this basin in, in overall length scale? Um, then it would actually be decaying as L to the minus three halves. So on average, we're expecting it to be infinite. And uh, in general, for real ones, we see L to the minus gamma. That just turns out to be the notation that's been used in the, in the literature, but yeah, L to the minus gamma. So it's a toy model. The number doesn't match up with the real world, but it actually has a lot of details that do. And so we'll look into that. Yeah. Scaling relations. All right, so uh, we've got a, let's connect this to area. So these are these two big pieces here. Uh, and there are many other little scaling relations and scaling laws and so on for river networks, but these are the ones we'll focus on. So we've got a basin of length L. Uh, we know about the standard deviation, right? So we can say, of a, of a random walk. So we say, all right, you know, typically it's L to the half. That's the kind of scaling we would expect. Uh, so the area of that, this random walk basin is going to be on the, you know, scaling with 
L times L to the half. So area is going to be scaling L to the three halves. So it's a proportional relationship. We can invert this. Might seem a funny thing to do, but it just connects with the literature, and this is known as Hack's law, which is the relationship between the length of a basin and its area. If it was, um, we've talked about this in scaling, if it was just simple um, isometric scaling or, or simple dimensional analysis, we would say this should be a half, right? Length and area. But the scaling's a bit, um, this is quite high relatively, it's two thirds, it's a big, it's a six, it's quite a big jump. Uh, the extreme would be one, right? So it's, this is really a lot. So this, this is suggesting we have these allometric basins, which we do in the toy model. Okay, let's convert between them to get our probability distribution. So we have a probability distribution for L. We have a relationship between A and L. And this is something we'll do a number of times. And so it's an important, it's a, it's a nice little uh, lead into um, the next set of slides, really, which is, um, and we'll use again for hot model and so on, which is transformation variables. Okay, so there's a, uh, we've, we've got a relationship between L and area, and then we're just going to say DL, uh, just straight up derivative, um, of DA to the two-thirds, so two-thirds comes down the front, we get A to the minus a third, DA. So this little blob we can use to um, replace DL, so we so we'll do that, so this is the normal thing that we do for transformation of um, Variable, uh, variables for, for moving to a probability distribution. P of, P of ADA, P of LBL, as I just fashioned. And we start, we start with the one we know, we know which is L to the last three halves DL, lots of proportional signs. And, and just plug, just plug in everything we know about L, which is the So So A itself, A itself, A itself is to the two thirds. DL, DL, we just see people who see this little bit more of a phrase up here. So, as a two thirds, we don't need that. Is that A to the minus of the other thing? Yeah, it's just part of the rational question. So, if you look at this, it's going to be A to the two thirds and half and half. A to the A is one, one. A to the A is a minus of the other. So, that would give us A to the A is a minus of the other. So, so minus four, minus four thirds. The new group of group where Jenkins and Jenkins and all just one point three three three, three. repeating repeating all across uh uh like less than less than one half one half one half three half three half five five you know this is an even extreme mean distribution right so it's um spots in the main group is closer closer the exponent is closer to one just a notation which has been used in the literature is tau so we'll stick with that okay so we have these nice connections between exponents. Uh, we see uh, we have the power distributions, right? So it's, again, we go to the landscape and we randomly choose a point in the landscape, and we ask you know, what's the um, average, what, what's the, you know, we, 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 we zoom out and find what's the area of the basin that we're at the end of that point, and what's the length of that basin. And of course, we move down the stream, the length just keeps growing, and the basin keeps growing, and you start to get in more tributaries and so on. A lot of, lot of architecture and, and uh, beautiful architecture actually in the river networks. So lots of studies over the years and they started with just surveys, eventually became satellite um, data and, and I, I did some of this myself in, in the 90s um, and I felt bad because I was looking at data. I felt like a, a bad person, um, but it was the right thing to do. So these are some ranges and, and you know really from small small data samples to start with. And we sort of see this as a repeated problem. Like you get some idea about some scaling. There's maybe 53 animals or whatever it is, 24 islands, and someone makes a big bold claim about uh, some universal scaling. All right, well, there, there's a, there are our ranges. Um, and this is just a then kind of expand it back out. So Hack's law, L, L to the A, A to the H. Um, it turns out, so, so this has been sort of discussed for a long, long time, because you know, it goes back to the 50s. The interesting thing was that Hack found 0.57, again, for a very small data set, three satellites. And everyone got excited, really, and especially physicists, like trying to figure out, like, why is this um, anomalous scaling there? Why is it allometric and not isometric? Turns out this is a paper published in 92 uh, by Montgomery and Dietrich. Um, Bill Dietrich very famous um, geomorphologist that showed that uh, 
if you if you take the largest basins of the world and just compare them, so it's not really basins within basins, a bit of a different thing. So we're taking all the basins, um, and really like over a huge range as well. Uh, so it's not just the largest ones. We did that, but uh, you know, really an enormous ensemble of basins. Then the scaling looks like a half, so it's not as exciting. Uh, but it may be for smaller ones, you you have allometry, and you know, for geology, you just put a landscape into a certain incline. Funny things are happening. Uh, certainly, models exist with interesting values of h, and so we would kind of want to understand them. So this is this is a nice example where um, I'll show you a scaling relation, and I'll show you that you can get universality classes. So connections between exponents. Uh, in general, we have these expressions, right? So it's h is Two thirds for the ribbon, for the random one, uh, four thirds for tau, and, and three halves for gamma. But you know, we can say, say, say them more generally. So we just go through the same process, and I won't detail it all. But basically, we're going to convert from length to area, the probability of length, the probability of area. We want to connect them across, and we're going to find tau in terms of uh, the exponents gamma and h. Same game as before. Um, we start with L to the minus gamma DL, and we just put in what we know about L. So we know L is A to the H. Let me get that thing. Uh, we know L is A to the H, right? That's all proportional. And then DL, we're just going to replace it with uh, A to the H minus 1 DA, and that's that's this piece up here. All right, so these things will um, combine. And if we do that, we can see that we're going to get A to the minus tau, and tau is going to be this, and we can rearrange it a little bit. It's 1 plus h gamma minus 1. So that's quite nice, right? So if we know h and gamma, we can we can say what tau is. And, and of course, you can measure these things and see that they're matching up um, with each other through this scaling relation, right? So this is a scaling relation. In general, with systems of scaling, you find you should, you know, if it's all coherent, this is really a story, you'll find scaling relations that connect the ex various exponents. And if you do a really good job, you can figure out that, you know, maybe only two or three exponents are independent, right? All of the others can be uh, cast in that way. And in fact, for, you know, so, so you need more um, knowledge of the architecture of river networks than we have talked about here. But it turns out that, that while this equation is true, there's actually a simpler relationship. Um, and, and the tau and uh, h can be tau and Right, so the area exponent and the length exponent can be connected to the hack, so-called hack exponent. So two thirds, two minus two thirds is four thirds. So it checks out, and two thirds, the inverse of that is three halves. So that's good too. And more generally, there are all these other kinds of um, scaling laws that people have kind of come up with over the years to describe um, river networks, and you you can kind of boil it down. Depends how you do it, but to, to hacks exponent h, and then a fractal exponent for uh, the rivers themselves, which is a bit dodgy because it's 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 just a bit greater than one, but it seems to be you know it's a separate little beast. So this becomes a way to simplify uh, system description, right? We've, we we don't even necessarily have to write we the parallels are sort of there, and we're just saying okay, here are the scalings, here are the exponents for these scalings, and. The game that we might play, we might be able to play, is what are the universality classes? And so there are models that have various values of h, tau, and gamma. They all fit together with these scaling relations. You know, and they have different mechanisms. And there are arguments about, well, there are only three universal um, cla universality classes. It has to be either this random river network one or another random resistor kind of one or whatever it is, right? So, um, or they're just the isometric one. Uh, anyway, that, that argument, it, to be honest, it's still playing out. I think it, it should have stopped, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of still going. So, but again, stepping outside of river networks or blood networks, systems that have scalings, um, both uh, allometric kind of scalings, and then also maybe they have probably size distributions in them that have power law decays. There are exponents that, uh, and, uh, that are uh, involved with all of those that should be connectable with these scaling relations, which themselves are usually quite simple, right? They're just simple algebraic you know, ratios, some products, nothing, nothing beyond that. Okay.
I'm going to finish with a few more examples of random walks and their generalizations. Uh, and it's a little strong, the title. It's a little much, but I'll, I'll just give you a couple here. So, yeah. Um, so you could start with, you could start at some point X and then let your random walk wander around. And when it reaches zero, game over. There are lots of models of failure and so on used in industry. Um, and they have all sorts of Bible distributions in this one. You have all sorts of things, exponential distributions. So this is a, uh, this this was one one used by uh, Josh White's, um, my old colleague. We did our PhD together. It's at Georgia Tech at the moment, and um, uh, where where they're able to exp show why mortality rates plateau, you know, for older ages. At least argue that a simple random walk mechanism could explain it. That doesn't mean it does. It's just that you know if you're trying to add some more elaborate story, then you know you have to go beyond this null model. PNAS, very good. Uh, okay, lots of other things. This is really just extraordinarily beautiful. And so I've shown you this kind of one crazy thing about uh, uh, random walks in terms of the, the, the first return problem. And of course, there's the glorious normal distribution at the heart of it. But there are many other pieces, and one of them, and so Levy is very famous here, uh, one of them is the um, uh, Arxon law, right? And so, and, and maybe I will go out to the web for this. So it's this probability distribution here, right? There's a T, um, this is the, the, it's for continuous time random walks, I think about Wiener processes. Um, this is a, Wiener, I guess. Um, we're going to let the thing run for time. T, capital T. So if you look at this little beast, it obviously explodes at t equals zero and um, t equals capital T. So it's going to go up. So this is an interesting distribution. And this applies to remarkably to uh, three aspects of random walks. And, and again, this continuous time random walks. Right. So you draw from this distribution, you will get the fraction of Right? It's the distribution for the fraction of time that a walk is positive, conversely negative, so it has to be symmetric. Um, the last time the walk changes sign, which is connected to our, um, our first return problem a little bit, and the time the maximum is achieved. The maximum for the walk, right? So the walk is right, and we're saying something, we're, we're making some story on top of it. So, same distribution. Uh, and there's some really remarkable uh, work that's it's the last 10 years, I suppose. Uh, starts in uh, Sid Redner's work, first piece that I, well, that I've referenced here at least is 2012. It's worked by Classette uh, as well. Um, and I should be pushing the wrong thing. Yeah, so, so that's these papers. But it well approximated by basketball score lines. And so uh, there's going to be some limits to what you can do there, but but it's pretty good. So let's go out to, let me see these things. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the oxide distribution looks like this. The, it's, it's, it's called the oxide because um, the, comp, the uh, cumulative distribution function is oxide. So, but here's the underlying probability distribution. Here's the cumulative. So you can see that once you get up, so this is normalized, right? This is this would be our time t, um, capital T here. There's a flat, right? There's there's nothing terribly special in the middle, but you know the minimum is at is at a half. But you expect to have you know the last time that the lead changes is really likely to be here or really likely to be here. The maximum is really likely to be here or really likely to be here as well. It's a it's a remarkable remarkable result. Uh, so, yeah, um, yeah, and a fraction of time positive, yeah. Uh, so it has to be symmetric. All right, so we did some work on Australian rules football, which if you've never watched, you should just basically spend the next three hours on YouTube watching the greatest highlights ever, because this is the greatest game ever. Um, incredibly spectacular. Uh, so 
that's a bit different. It's, it's interesting. And part of the game, part of what happens there is your overall score matters at the end of the year, right? So number of wins and your overall score, so just sheer point differential. So if you're beating another team, you you continue to beat them, right? You destroy them. So it's it's a festival. So you have score lines that just go like that. Uh, you know, American football people will uh, get incredibly upset if you if you score points on them. So because it, it it matters less, but I've always found that very strange given that everyone's trying to kill each other anyway. So, all right. They're all just random walks, but it, rather remarkable, right? I mean, it really does, basketball in particular really does seem to follow pretty quite, it, it random walks with some slight uh, adjustments to it. Not too much, a little bit, some um, anti-persistence and things. And you can put in the, you can factor in the, quality of the teams as well, right? So if a team is better than the other, there'll be a drift. Um, okay, so fractional random walks, there's a whole story here, Brand uh, fractional Brownian motion, levy flights, so again, this is levy. Uh, there are different ways to do this, um, but, but basically memory gets involved in the system now, right? So random walks are memoryless, except for the fact that you know where you are now, and you just add to that point, but you don't remember where you've been before. Um, for fractional Brownian motion, you start to, that, that starts to matter, and I just have a couple of points here. If you want to look, is this ample um, material, um, pretty famous um, uh, work by Montreal and Schlesinger, it was uh, 82. So, but let's just think about, just, just to sort of push a little bit in, in, into what happens here. So, standard deviation sigma, right, scales is t to the half. This is our thing for random walks. But for fractional random walks, we start to, we move away from that. So we have these three cases now, and we'll say that alpha equals half is normal Brownian motion, normal random, or Brownian motion, random walks, simple random walk. Uh, if it's greater than a half, if you observe that the standard deviation is going, growing greater than a half, uh, with an exponent greater than a half with time, then that's called super diffusive. Still has that kind of dis, you know spreading feature to it, but it's super diffusive. The bigger jumps involved, uh, and it's if it's not spreading as much, then it's sub diffusive. There are other things in here like roughness can be measured for um, what's called roughness can be measured for uh, uh, time series and so on. There are many many things, and the Hurst exponent is is the the term there. Okay, so that can be generalized, and I think I just kind of have this one example here. So it's so a really important thing is that memory now matters. Okay. Uh, this is uh, an example of the movement of dollar bills. And it's from the Where's George uh, game, basically, which still exists online, but seems kind of pretty shaky. Uh, but it was sort of a big thing in the early 2000s. George Washington, right? So you got a dollar bill, and if it said, or if you knew about this, or it might have a little stamp on it, which is wrong, um, that said, you know, go to where'sgeorge.com. And you would put in the... Um, uh, whatever it is, the number on the thing, and where you are, the date, and then let it go, right? And so you would, you know, use it, and uh, you would maybe track it, and if you did this a lot, then maybe someone else would do it. And you could see where your dollar bill went. And, then, you know, it was certainly one that had was, you know, that, that you knew had been part of the project. Um, you know, you could go online and see where it's been. So it was an interesting data set to get hold of and analyze. And, and uh, Brockman and colleagues, Dirk Brockman, um, who uh, was at Northwestern, has been in Germany for a good while. He's a you know, very highly regarded complex system scholar. Uh, did some rather beautiful things with this, with um, fractional um, differential equations and so on. And they were able to show that it, it went beyond just uh, fractional brain in motion, if I have it right, that that there's a sort of a, if you looked in time, there's a kind of a quiescent uh, period where it didn't move for a long time. And you have this weird sampling problem, obviously, you don't know where the thing's been the whole time, but that's okay. Um, so it's going along, and then suddenly it would take off. So once things moved, they were super diffusive, right? And, you know, people move around. This is you know, early 2000s, of course, people travel. Um, dollar bills travel in funny ways too. It's not just person to person, so that's, uh, you know, a complicating factor, but this is these are examples of dollar bills leaving Seattle, um, Jacksonville, and, and New York, right? They're really traveling all around the 
the country. So this was an early um, in investigation, you know, big data kind of thing, looking at how people move around before social media takes off. You know, now you can track all sorts of things. Questionably, of course. Um, but this is a fairly gentle, polite, kind of fun, anonymous thing, um, I think. Uh, but, you know, they, they did try to connect it to disease, right? So, you know, what does this suggest about disease spreading? Uh, there's other work that came soon after, looking about looking at tracking cell phone uh, people's movement by cell phones, and that let, and we did one with Twitter actually. That's our work with Morgan Frank, who's now at um, Pittsburgh, uh, looking at yeah how people move around. And you could see there was a home place and a um, a workplace kind of thing, and then it, uh, in some cases a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth place, right? And this is an old sociological concept that people have their primary um, location, their work location, in the before times, maybe we'll get back to it. Um, and the third place, and Starbucks, for example, talked about this early on. They wanted to be uh, people's third place. The, the, so anyway, you, you, you know, really kind of pops out in all of, all of those studies. So uh, in terms of how disease spreads, you know, we'll, we'll get to that later in the, in the, in the course with, with, with some different, different approaches perhaps. But yeah, um, rare events are a real problem, right? I mean, if you're thinking about bad things spreading, if you think about good things spreading, it's terrific. But uh, bad things spreading, you know, one person takes a trip from Seattle to uh, Jacksonville and sneezes on someone else. And if it's, if it's uh, say, an aerosol, you know, airborne disease, it could be really bad. Okay, but, you know, that's an interesting expansion into a different way with, you know, ultimately, what are kind of random walk, random motion type things um, moving into a, a fractional um, space. Okay. Okay. I think I will now depart back into the ether. It's true. We visited the mountains of, uh, um, the unexpected mountains of reality. You know, we have to confront them. And this, this, this postcard is, you know, it's one of the mechanisms, right? This is the levee flight idea that instead of having random walks, now we have um, the walks that can have jumps built into them. So this is this pleplo problem. So we have trees of unusual size, houses of unusual shapes. Um, and so it's the road of surprises through the disconcerting woods. And so now you've got this half plus alpha, right? Super diffusive scaling. Um, Princess Bride reunion was on last night, so it all it all ties together. Even though I, it was years ago, also Princess Bride was thirty three years ago. So um, that's one way to get to these mountains. We will uh, get them in in, in other ways in, in the next uh, slide sets. The thing with random walks is that they're not competing, right? These zombie walkers, or even in these ones. They're not competing. They're not fighting against each other for anything or helping each other. They're just randomly doing their own thing, and then we look at a whole ensemble of them. But we also want to think about systems, you know, ecologies, and so on. Where there is, you know, the effects, the pressures, and so on of all of these different species or cities or people, whatever it is, interacting with each other. Now I will slide into the ether. And I, yes. Okay. 